Howdy. Point of this video is to cover some of the important concepts uh, from quantum mechanics and to understand how this affects uh, electronic structure of atoms and of uh, matter as a whole. So why do we care about quantum mechanics? Um, you know, really this is a description of things at a very, very small scale. Um, and maybe you might think that it's not particularly applicable to large macroscopic uh, physical objects and their properties. Uh, well, um, as I mentioned before, quantum mechanics is a description of the electronic structure of atoms and of matter. And so that means if we want to talk about electron densities, if we want to talk about bonding, if we want to talk about any physical properties that are related to electronic structure, so definitely electric, electrical properties, optical properties, uh, thermal properties, um, all of these are affected by uh, the structure of the electrons in a system. And so that means to really understand uh, this structure, we need to know something about quantum mechanics. So just a couple examples. Uh, here's one study uh, where we were looking at uh, introducing foreign particles uh, and, and, and bits of uh, catalysts into a system to understand how that changed the electronic density in the material which uh, could potentially affect how it uh, reacts. So these are catalyst particles. Uh, one other um, example is understanding the electronic band structure of materials. So this is an example uh, of graphene uh, and we're plotting energy in uh, momentum space here. Uh, and, and really uh, the, the band gap and the curvature of these electronic bands as they get close to each other affect how electrons uh, move through the material. We call this electronic transport. Um, in both of these cases, uh, to get a good physical understanding of the system, uh, we need to know something about quantum mechanics. Okay. So, what is quantum mechanics all about? Uh, it became clear at some point that um, electrons are not very well described as just point particles. Um, so this fellow Schrodinger came along and asked the question, okay, uh, if an electron has wave-like properties, there must be some sort of equation uh, that governs the property of those waves. And so Schrodinger's big contribution uh, was the introduction of the Schrodinger equation. So this comes in a couple different uh, variants. There's time independent, time dependent, non-relativistic, relativistic forms. We're going to focus just on the time independent, non-relativistic form for the moment um, and, and, and try and understand what it means. And really all of this equation says is that if I'm going to describe an electron by a wave, some sort of wave function, it has to satisfy a certain condition. And that is when I operate on that wave function using what we call an operator, this is called the Hamiltonian operator, uh, I'm going to get the same wave function back uh, times a scalar, which is the energy. Um, so this Hamiltonian operator uh, can just be broken down into two different parts. There's something that describes the kinetic energy, and there's a part that describes the potential energy. So this might look a little weird, might look a little bit like, uh, you know, complicated math, what's going on. Um, but, you know, you've experienced things like this before. Um, when we talk about classical physics and you want to talk about the kinetic energy of a particle, um, we say kinetic energy equals one half mv squared squared. So the kinetic energy in this case um, is related to some other property, in this case, the velocity uh, of, of the particle. Uh, so, so all this, this is, this is doing a very similar thing. It's just saying if we start off with this wave function that describes the electron, we operate it, we operate on it by um, a mathematical operator. And what we get back is the wave function times uh, the overall energy product of the material. So you see here, I have um, left this ambiguous. This is just some potential energy function uh, that is a function of the distance from the nucleus. So depending on the system, we could consider uh, introducing different sorts of potential energy functions. So one of the classical problems that you'll see 
in quantum mechanics is called the particle in a box. And so we describe some potential energy function that it has um, zero potential energy over some uh, distance range. And outside that box, the potential energy is infinite. So that's one particular case. Um, if we're talking about an atom, um, then this potential energy is going to be given by the interaction between the positively charged nucleus um, and the negatively charged uh, electron, right? So uh, we, in this case, if I want to describe the potential energy for a hydrogen-like atom, um, I can use the Coulombic potential, which, if you remember, is um, charge one times charge two, four pi epsilon naught, times the distance between the two charges. And in the hydrogen atom, the charge on the nucleus is positive E, the charge on the electron is negative E, and so we get negative E squared over four pi epsilon naught R. So, um, so this is a specific case of the time-independent Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom. Now again, remember, uh, this is just describing some wave function, uh, which is describing the electron. Um, so in order for uh, a wave function to describe the electron in the hydrogen atom, it must satisfy this condition. So uh, this looks a bit complicated, um, but it's possible to solve it. Uh, and, and this is what Schrodinger did. He went in, he broke down uh, this problem. He broke it into radial components and spherical components and found a solution to the very simple simple case of a hydrogen atom, which has one positively charged uh, nucleus and one negatively charged uh, wave function around it. Um, so again, you know, this might look a little complicated. We're not going to derive it here. Uh, that's what you would do in a introductory quantum mechanics class, something like physical chemistry. Um, but we get a potential solution. Um, L stands for the Laguerre functions. Y here are the spherical harmonics. So this is potentially a little confusing listening, but what I want you to realize is that this is giving us not a single wave function. This is giving us uh, the conditions that a wave function must satisfy in order to be a solution to the problem, the description of the hydrogen atom as we set it up. Um, so for a wave function to satisfy this condition, uh, we see a couple n's and l's and m's in here. So these are all integers. And the only solutions to this particular wave function are given when n, l, and m are specific integers. OK, so let's review this one quick time. Uh, the Schrodinger equation just describes the conditions that have to be satisfied uh, for this uh, electronic wave function um, to uh, exist in a system. So we can define our system. Um, for the hydrogen atom, we put in uh, Coulombic potential between a positively charged nucleus and a negatively charged uh, electron orbiting around it. Um, and we found uh, a set of solutions that describe um, potential wave functions that electrons can occupy uh, for this case, for the hydrogen atom. OK, so but what do these mean, right? Um, the first, let's, let's look at these integers and see what values they can take. Um, there's basically a certain set of rules that comes out of this, uh, this solution to the hydrogen atom. N, we call this the principal quantum number, can take values of 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it can take positive integer values. For each number n, L 
can take some integer uh, integral value from 0 all the way up to n minus 1. So in the case of n equals 1, L, and we call this the angular momentum quantum number, or sometimes the azimuthal uh, quantum number, can take values from 0 up to n minus 1. So for n equals 1, L is restricted to 0. For n equals 2, L can be 1 or 0, uh, and so on. M sub L uh, describes uh, the magnetic, uh, it's the magnetic quantum number. Uh, and this ultimately is going to describe an orientation of our orbitals. So M sub L is allowed to take values from negative L all the way up to positive L. Again, still just integral values. So for example, in this case, N equals 2. For L equals 1, M sub L could be negative 1, 0, or 1. Or for L equals 0, M sub L can only be 0. Finally, M sub S, and we call this the spin quantum number, can take values of positive 1 half or negative 1 half. OK, um, what, what do these uh, numbers mean? What we typically um, have learned in our uh, introductory chemistry, and in fact, chemistry as far back as high school, maybe even before that, uh, is we talk about orbitals, right? We talk about 1s, 2s, 2p, these sort of things. Um, so the quantum numbers, again, remember these are numbers that give a potential uh, solution to the wave function. What uh, the physical interpretation of the wave function um, is that the square of the wave function is uh, proportional to the probability uh, density. So the probability of finding some electronic density in a given region of volume. So that means that we can um, look at the square of the wave function and it'll give us some idea of the shape of the electronic orbital. So um, n, remember this is the principal quantum number, we usually refer to this as the shell. So if n is 1, this is the first shell. If n is 2, this is the second shell, third shell, so on and so forth. L, the azimuthal quantum number, uh, or angular momentum quantum number, um, gives us some idea of the shape of that orbital uh, in uh, the distribution of that orbital probability density in three dimensions. So this is the shape of orbitals. So for L equals zero, it gives a spherically symmetric shape. So these are the S orbitals. For L, L equals one, we have one node. So one plane where there's zero probability of finding electron density on that plane. Um, so these are the p orbitals. For L equals 2, we have two nodes. Uh, for L equals 3, we have three nodes. Um, this one is a little bit more difficult to draw. So this uh, describes kind of the spherical distribution of the probability density of that wave function. So again, L is 0, we refer to as s orbitals. L is 1, we refer to as p orbitals. L is 2, these are the d orbitals. And for L is 3, this gives us the f orbitals. Finally, m sub L, uh, this is the magnetic uh, quantum number. This uh, talks about the orientation of those orbitals. So for an s orbital, there's only one possible orientation because it's spherically symmetric. For a p orbital, uh, we could have that node along the uh, x equals 0 plane, along the z equals 0 plane, or along the y equals 0 plane. So the orbitals um, oriented along the x-axis, along the z-axis, or along the y-axis. Um, for the d orbitals, it gets a little bit more complicated and even more complicated still for the 
uh, f orbitals. But all of these um, describe the orientation of those orbitals in three-dimensional space. So that is the magnetic quantum number. Okay, here's another uh, visualization of what these orbitals look like. So let's uh, let's look at just one set first of all. So remember L uh, is the angular momentum quantum number. L equals zero are the s orbitals. So these are all spherically symmetric. Um, for n equals one, these would be our one s orbitals. And so there is there are no nodes in the n equals one case. In the n equals two case, two s. There's one sphere, and it's a little difficult to draw in this case, but it's right around here um, that there's no probability of finding an electron at that particular uh, radial distance from the nucleus. For the n equals 3, that's 3s case, there's two nodes. For the n equals 4, 4s case, there's three nodes. And I can show you two of them. The third one is too close to the center to visualize really easily. Um, and so on. So these are the s orbitals in increasing uh, increasing shells. So one thing that we immediately notice is as I go to higher and higher principal quantum numbers, the radial distribution gets further and further out. And so we could talk about that in terms of the radius of the atom, the distance uh, at which we're likely to find an electron is getting larger and larger at increasing shells. Okay, let's look at the second set. So L equals one, again, this is the angular momentum quantum number. Um, the first case, I have one planar node. So this is the 2p. In this case, I have a planar node and also a radial node. So these are the 3p. And it it uh, proceeds downward. So in all of these cases, I have one planar node, but an increasing number of radial nodes, just like the, uh, the S case. Uh, at higher and higher principal quantum numbers, we have more and more radial nodes. Um, for L equals 2, these are our d orbitals. So we have 3d, 4d, so on. Um, so a couple of things that we see immediately. There is no such thing as a 1p orbital. And that's because, remember, for n equals 1, the angular momentum quantum number can only take values from, uh, it can only take values from 0 up to n minus 1. And so for n equals 1, this is zero, so the only acceptable value of L is zero. So we have a 1s, but no 1p, no 1d. Um, so we only introduce uh, p orbitals in the second shell, d orbitals in the third shell, f orbitals in the fourth shell, and so on. So how does this relate back to the periodic table, the organization of electrons um, and atoms that you're used to seeing? Okay, let's think about this again. So for n equals one, I only have an s orbital. Remember, m sub s, uh, the uh, spin quantum number, can take positive one half or negative one half. So that means I can put two electrons in each orbital. So the one s uh, atoms are hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen has one electron in the one s, helium has two electrons in the one s orbital. Let's go to the next shell. So for n equals two, I could have a uh, 2s uh, orbital. And so that gets filled by lithium and beryllium. But now I can also have the 2p orbitals. Now 2p orbitals, there are three different orbitals. Each are given by a different um, magnetic quantum number. And each of those orbitals can have positive one half or negative one half values for the spin. And so three orbitals times two electrons means that um, there's six different uh, 
there, there's, uh, it, there are six electrons total that can go in. And so filling those up sequentially, uh, we fill this second row um, block of atoms over here. And we would proceed on, right? So we have three S electrons, three P electrons. The three, uh, the third shell can have D orbitals, um, but these don't get filled until a little bit later. Uh, and we'll talk about this in the video on electronic filling rules. Okay, um, so in review, quantum mechanics is necessary for us to describe electronic densities, for us to describe uh, bonding between two different atoms, uh, and really for us to describe any sort of electronic, optical, magnetic properties. Uh, these are all functions of the electronic dense, uh, the ele electronic distribution in a material. Um, what are the quantum numbers? The quantum numbers are simply these integers um, that give different poten potential solutions uh, to the Schrodinger wave equation for some atom. Um, so we can uh, we can derive the solution for the hydrogen atom, and I showed that to you. We didn't derive it, we just showed it. Um, we can't actually solve the Schrodinger equation for anything more complicated than the hydrogen atom. So if we have a system that has even two electrons, that's too complicated to solve. So we have to start introducing approximations um, and, and different ways to uh, get close to a solution. Um, but, but this is what we're doing computationally these days in what's called density functional theory uh, and, and uh, quantum mechanic mod modeling. Um, these quantum numbers, uh, the physical significance uh, is that they're describing both the energy levels of a potential orbital and its distribution, uh, the electronic distribution um, around an atom. Uh, so we can think about these as describing the traditional orbitals that you learn about in chemistry. Finally, uh, these four quantum numbers, n, l, m sub l, and m sub s, um, they all have slightly different interpretation. Right? The shell tells you something about the overall energy and how far out this distribution is. The angular momentum or azimuthal quantum number talks about the spherical distribution of this electronic density. So really, it, it's telling us about what kind of orbital. m sub l gives us orientation. So we could have the p orbitals oriented along the z, along the x, or along the y axis. And finally, m sub s is the spin quantum number. And this can always be either spin up or spin down, but this is what gives us two electrons in each uh, potential orbital.